uh, thank you so much, Lauren, for that introduction. And again, um, I just want to welcome you to our first panel for Talking, uh, Talking Galleries New York 2022 um, and thank our hosts, Talking Galleries and Schwartzman Ann. Um, as Lauren mentioned, um, the talk for today is called Galleries the Next Generation. Um, and so I will be love to introduce our, my four panelists. Um, Directly to my right is um, Nicole Calderon, who is the founder and director of Calderon, a gallery based here in New York that focuses on exhibiting and supporting the work of artists from Latin America and its diaspora. Um, she currently has on view um, an exhibition curated by Tif artist Tiffany Alfonseca called Pal Patio. Um, next to her is Alex Logsdale, who is the CEO of Listen Gallery, uh, an influential gallery founded by his father, Nicholas Logsdale in 1967 in London. Uh, Alex joined the gallery in 2009, launched its New York space here and has helped oversee its continued expansion, um, growing its presence in New York, as well as um, outposts in East Hampton, Los Angeles, Shanghai, and Beijing. The gallery here in New York currently has two um, solo shows up, one for Chana Horowitz and the other for art, uh, the artist collective Art and Language. Um, next to him is Kim Bung Kim, who is a partner at Commonwealth and Council in Los Angeles's Koreatown uh, neighborhood. The gallery is rooted in a commitment to explain how a community of artists can sustain their coexistence through generosity and hospitality, and by celebrating the manifolds of identities and championing women, queer, POC, and allied artists. Um, the gallery recently just closed an exhibition for Jemima uh, Wyman and David al um, And last but certainly not least is Nicola Vassell, who is the founder of Nicola Vassell Gallery, also here in New York, um, which is committed to the to discourse that widens the lens of the history and the future of art through an intergenerational inter and cross-disciplinary pro program of international artists. Uh, the show currently up at the gallery is uh, solo for Frida Urupado. And so, yeah, I think what we most want to hear about today and what will guide our conversation is how to run a gallery in 2022 that focuses on everything I've kind of teased. Um, but I think we want to hear in everyone's own words what the vision and mission for your gallery is and how that um, positions what you see on the wall and your relationships with artists and essentially how that goes to sales, not only to private collectors, but to um, institutions. So um, Nicholas, since we have that sight line and you mentioned early going first, why don't you kick us off? The reason I sat here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you for having me here. It's wonderful to be among my esteemed panelists, uh, friends, and uh, thank you, Alan and, and the team. So wonderful to be here. Um, but the gallery right now is very much focused on thinking about as it, you said in the introduction, the history and the future of art, particularly uh, in this moment when the history, uh, many histories are being called into consideration or being asked for recontextualization. I think it's incumbent upon those of us who speak directly with the art viewing public to present narratives that can help aid that journey. So, you know, I really like the idea of mixing stories, uh, you, you know, very established new artists, tackling things that really relate to the lived experience. I think it's so important with all we've lost to uh, connect with people and say, you know, I understand what you're going through. Here's something that may reveal uh, you, the human experience or the shared experience, mm -hmm. the lived experience. So I'd say that's kind of what uh, uh, I'm doing at the gallery. And as a consequence, clients, museums, I mean, they're all on the same journey. What mm -hmm. is the future based on how we will reconsider history? So it's not a hard sell. Mm -hmm. I think it is really what we're all going through. Kiba? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, for Commonwealth and Council, um, we started out as an artist and gallery by my business partner, Yang Chung. Um, at his apartment on Commonwealth and Council. That's where the name comes mm -hmm. from. And, um, you know, from the beginning, you know, there's a long history of uh, artist run spaces that have done great programming over the years. But I think one way in which Young kind of had a vision from the beginning was to be able to do something where the artist would have multiple shows. Because a lot of artist run spaces run for a short time, do amazing work, and kind of fade away as folks get busy. And he said that, like, 
he wanted it to be a place where the artists would be proud to put on their CVs and to remember that they had this history and to develop their careers in. But it ran kind of as a like a you know non-selling artists run space for six, seven years um, before a few core group of artists who had been showing for a long time, including like Galapos Kim, EJ Hill, and Daniel Dean, who are in the Whitney Biennial right now, um, kind of had an intervention with Young and said, you know, these commercial galleries are approaching us and we'd like to do this together. Um, would that we like to do this with you? Will you represent us? So that happened in 2017, which is sort of when I joined and we've been in this wild ride doing art fairs and dealing with like the collectors and the more institution, more active institutional engagement. Um, but I kind of wanted to tell a brief history that way because, um, and I think we're still very much led by um, what the artists need and what the, the, the artists um, want to build together. Um, because a lot of the artists in our program um, have been friends and kind of navigated their careers uh, 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 with each other, amongst each other. And that kind of conversation is very important as well. And that kind of mission statement of sorts that you read um, in my intro, you know, I mean, it might speak, it, 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 might, it, 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 might, it might read like something that, uh, perhaps feels, you know, fashionable to say, to say that we're committed to diversity of voices and um, championing minoritarian voices. But, um, you know, we were able to write that in like 2016, 17, after we had years of programming. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is like important to us is that we figure things out, make mistakes and build something and is not so kind of like led by a predetermined vision um, and uh, as Nicola said you know the, the art world is really like a larger ecosystem and all of the players play an integral role in how artists are able to um, build a successful career and just a livelihood um, platforms and opportunities to show and make work um, but I'm very interested excited by this panel that it's, 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 it's a very um, funny moment uh, for me personally to have a conversation about what the gallery landscape is today because we're very much at this juncture where you know we were kind of like a young gallery with emerging artists and making these bigger decisions about where we go what a sustainable future for a gallery like commonwealth and council might look like and being perfectly frank like um, it's a very, very, very challenging time for small galleries to grow as the market has become accelerated, as younger artists get picked up by these larger galleries um, um, more quickly. And there are wild vacillations in the market that attend, often attend to that. Um, and the pressures that it uh, puts on institutional acquisitions and shows and everything just becomes so fast and it's so much work. Um, I'm really burnt out right now, actually. Um, so, so that's why my face looks like this. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm very curious to hear from um, all of you and from the audience too, because uh, I think these kinds of challenging times can hopefully also present opportunities. Mm. Alex, do you want to take the next one? Your gallery is a little bit on the larger side than yeah. our other three esteemed panelists. Um, <laughs> so, well, I, it, it's, it's a very strange, I mean, it's, I mean, a, it's strange position in that, um, you know, the gallery has been around 54 years. Um, so we're, and sort of threading that needle between a very storied history of, uh, of a gallery that's been sort of stalwart gallery in Europe and especially in London for half a century and bring the gallery to the US and then into Asia as well in a way that makes sense. How does one do that? How do you bring in a new generation of artists um, that fits? Keeping that continuity is very difficult. Um, it's a very, very fine balance. And doing it in a way that's responsible to everyone as well is also very difficult. Um, so uh, finding finding that equilibrium is something I think about a lot. And as, as you were saying, you know, the, this there is this 
this balance of how you get to how a gallery grows. And having grown up watching the gallery grow, you know, the gallery was never a giant gallery. It was a very influential, large gallery, but in London. And the gallery always had, the gallery's strength always was that it grew with its artists. Mm -hmm. And I think that's critically important. I think a gallery has to grow with its artists if it wants to, to maintain itself, survive, um, and, and retain its artists. I think it's, it's really the only, um, it's the only means of survival. Yeah. Nicole. Hi. Um, well, I, my gallery is brand new. Right. Um, we just opened in September. So we're about six months in and um, our mission is to create an art business that's equitable for all. And that's including the gallery, the artists, clients, and the public. Mm -hmm. And the vision for the gallery is an inclusive program that has a focus on Latin American artists and diaspora artists, as you mentioned in the intro. And yeah. And yeah, just a follow-up um, question, specifically for Nicole and Nicola, can you guys both talk about what it was like opening a gallery in the middle of the pandemic, starting a new business, um, especially after a period in which people could not attend um, galleries, they were all closed um, during the initial lockdown? Yeah, well, I have to say it was incredibly difficult. I think it's the hardest I've ever worked in my life to get this started simply because there were so many disruptions in how one might go about getting a business off the ground. At the same time, and, and as one has to do, uh, the, the, there was a half fullness to the class as well, in that, um, you know, I had worried in the months leading up to the pandemic that the art world was, was at the height of its cacophonous self, you know, so many art fairs, so many people distracted as it goes through its ebbs and flows. And so I was concerned about how I could make a mark and enter the conversation meaningfully. And then of course, with the pandemic, things quieted so eerily and it weirdly gave space for much more single-minded focus and clarity and uh, purpose. It was literally get the doors open. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't having to run here, run there and fulfill all the other art world obligations. So I think we just took that and, and ran with it. And um, consequently, you know, the, the beauty is that we didn't start the business, you know, with projections looking in 2019, mm -hmm. 2018, we began the business when things were literally, it's super flux. Mm -hmm. And therefore we were able to adapt quite um, nimbly. And, you, you know, when you think about, issues like transport and you know supply pro issues mm. challenges um we just adapt mm. you know we are not sitting on the hope of a past that is long gone and we have no idea what the future will be so i think it's made us quite adaptive a being and um so we'll see how it shakes out mm. nicole do you have anything to add yeah, the idea of the gallery came about during the pandemic. Mm. So in 2020, that's kind of when it came into fruition and we opened last year in 2021. And so we don't know any different. Mm. We knew that we were going to open during this time. And we were, as Nicola was also saying, adapting to the time and things like that. And I mean, we have, we've had a situation where we wanted to do a talk in December and that was the height of Omicron. And then that was in person and then it had to be postponed and reshuffled and done online. So it's been incredibly challenging, but it's been also really an adventure to figure out how to adapt and move in this new time of how to function in a business. Yeah, and just, you know, um, thinking back to our wonderful keynote by Lindsay, uh, you know, I guess, how would you guys describe where we are now as a gallery? Kimba, you kind of hinted at that earlier in your comments. But um, within the art market, where are we and kind of what, what do you think has changed um, within the pandemic, but even prior to the pandemic um, in terms of sales and running a gallery? I know you all have experience running um, galleries prior to um, your own individual um, enterprises. Um, Kimon, why don't you kick us off? Um, 
Yeah, well, you know, what, what, what Alex mentioned, um, uh, I think is very relevant is that, um, well, firstly, I, I, I just like to kind of like point out like um, Nicola and Nicole starting during the pandemic, you know, uh, we started in 2010, so it was still in the throes of the financial crisis. 67, I imagine, was kind of- There was, no, of there was no contemporary art market. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I just want to like highlight that because I, I do think that's one of the most like, like beautiful magical aspects about the art world is that these kinds of times of crisis are really fertile ground for enterprising, you know, experimentation. You know, you don't have much to lose. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember like Margaret Lee, who started 47 Canal um, right around the same time, spoke of it very much. You know, she negotiated a free rent in this building that, and started throwing parties and events. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I yeah want to say that um but uh uh getting back to what alex um mentioned is you know how listen's been able to navigate the um changing market and the, the the whole art world and how it really the gallery always grew with the artists i think that is just like especially if you're starting out almost untenable mm -hmm. in the current market conditions and we do have to pay attention to that and all of us in this room and our colleagues and in, in, in this kind of milieu industry need to recognize that what we're seeing today is just makes no sense like uh when when an artist is graduating from school and having their first solo show at a gallery and first of all the pricing being like twenty thirty thousand dollars and everything sold out and um and then they institute a buy one get one and gift one to a museum kind of thing when they really haven't even figured out what they're doing yet yeah. oftentimes and of course like that only happens to a very 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 specific kind of art making you know mm -hmm. a particular kind of painting that, that 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 checks some boxes of what the market demand is you know you know i haven't been in the art world that long but i did i was around for the um process-based uh, abstraction boom in the 2013, 2014, you know, mm -hmm. which was like the peak of the art market. Um, and what we, like back then, you know, a, a young artist selling for $100,000 was a big deal. Now I feel like that's nothing. It's like mm -hmm. three, four hundred dollars $400,000 out of the gate. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I had coffee with a um, collector yesterday who mentioned that, uh, you know, for, 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 for an artist, uh, a young artist who's making great work, um, to uh, at the gallery had this like um uh uh, uh the, the the bogo arrangement mm -hmm. and so it had to one had to be a promise gift to an institution and um they were telling me that well the gallery kept following up being like who are you going to give it to mm -hmm. which to me was surprised i don't know maybe this is standard but like to me it was very surprising because when we ask for promise gifts it's because we have institutions that want them mm -hmm. you know <laughs> to to rely on the donor to find an institution to ram this artwork by a 25 year old into yeah. like um, that is not like this is not okay this is not sustainable and like if this is the record that we're going to live the leave behind as like the the the, the, the artwork that mattered that entered these museum collections and these artists, yeah, sell for half a million dollars and everyone forgets about them two years from now. Um, but, 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 but the pressure that it puts on us as the galleries is that everything's so accelerated. So we cannot, it is impossible for smaller galleries to grow at the pace to sustain and support these arts markets, mm. you know? Um, yeah, I just want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> anyone have a direct I, I, I do think that I do think that kind of buy one gift one thing is a very very problematic I think it's not something we do um at all if someone wants to buy a work and gift it to an institution and an institution wants their work fantastic everyone's everyone's happy but this other this other thing is it's sort of like a production line I don't have that many works to do <laughs> like I don't have two works for one person to buy one and a gift one I don't have that much work mm -hmm. So, it, and, it, and it creates this kind of false, um, false sense of demand, which I think further spirals this, this auction stuff. And I think it's deeply problematic. And I, I think there's a, a degree of restraint that people should try and, uh, try and um, execute, but it's difficult. Yeah. Um, it's very hard for people to, to, to feel like, Everyone, everyone wants to be in a hurry. 
Right. And I think this this kind of this hurriness is really a really a problem. I don't know how I don't know what the solution is particularly other than just being a bit more restrained on a, as best one can individual on an individual level. I mean, it's really reassuring to hear that you, as you know, really enterprising gallerists, feel that way because the bogo is frustrating everyone. It really, mm. really is. I think it'll go down as a moment, you know, that there was an idea that this formula might work, mm. but there's an incredible amount of resistance on the collector side there. I have heard it over and over and over. It's just not the way people want to do business. And, you know. But also on the institutional side, institutions I've heard from curators regularly, they get offered things because the gallery has said, you need to buy one, gift one. And the institution said, well, I'm going to give you this. And the institution says, well, I don't want this. Yeah. So, you know, then where do you go? Then you have to, then what do you do? You cancel the sale. It's, it's, it's just, it's not right. I don't think it's an organic process. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Nicole, how have you experienced that? Um, well, I have really no experience <laughs> with Bogo. <laughs> Um, and I'm actually trying to even understand it, um, but um, it, it seems like there is a problem where perhaps it seems to be working because institutions are taking it in. Otherwise, why would clients think of this? Mm. And so that, I guess that's my question for you. Like, is well, it's often come to the galleries because we have excess demand for these younger artists and in order to, well, first of all, I think it's just kind of show these artists like look what i'm doing for you you know um, <laughs> right but uh yeah i mean yeah i was i was speaking with a curator just last week from a major museum here in the city and they were like we've been getting inundated with these figurative painting hmm. uh, gift offers we're just we just have a, we just have a policy now of saying no you know um and uh yeah i mean i like i i think and and particularly you know uh you know, some have said, and this is this has been around for you know, if the art world was a dealer critic system, that those were the most kind of like influential players who built value and recognition for an artist. Now we're perhaps in the dealer collector system, which you know which speaks a little bit to what Lindsay was saying about um, what's happening with um, art media and mm -hmm. press. Uh, but you know, collectors, mega collectors, have increasing influence in the art world. Which is like you know fine to a certain extent there are amazing collectors out there who who can who can do a lot you know and i mean let's be honest like you know very few people provide all the funds that makes this whole thing go around you know yeah. but um uh for these donors to feel the pressure mm -hmm. to because because now what i'm hearing is like then the gallery is putting the pressure on the donor to use their sway to try to force these artworks into museum collections that don't are not very enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. I think it's like we're trying to, and you know, it's the job of art dealers to hustle. Yeah. You know, but uh, I think you have to draw a line somewhere. And um, I feel like we're trying to write art history. Um, in a certain way. And, and if we do subscribe to the whole thing, you know, we want to like change the canon or whatever um uh i mean i think i think i think it's a it's, it's really really pernicious and i think the the whole bogo thing goes to kind of like a, a marketing thing because that then the artist can add it to their cv that they're in x y and z collection it gives them a certain cloud and it can raise prices so i think we, what we've heard so far is kind of the contrast to what alex mentioned earlier about growing with your artist so how would you guys say um, your approach to growing responsibly with your artists, what does that kind of strategy look like? And no, it's the secret sauce, but. <laughs> well, I mean, I definitely think that as we all can recognize right now, the artist relationship is also very, very different. Artists happen to be far more autonomous than they ever have before. They are running their studios like full on businesses and, mm -hmm. um, as they have to otherwise they collapse on the, the weight yeah. markets and other systems um so again you know we we take very adaptive approach because in our inherent purpose is to understand our artists and reflect that and if they you know have a certain way that they want to go about things we have to at least be open and watch with 
I'll be cautiously maybe and help support and carry along again in this, the, the early stages of all these relationships that may or may not grow with the gallery. But we have to be open to that, mm. the fact that this, the, and I think this is true for this moment generally, that there, it's, things are finite, things do come to an end, you know, and if they can persist, wonderful, but, you know, we do our best aiding as we go along. And I think at the front end of that, tactically, the idea is to make sure you work with artists who you truly love and who love you, basically, because mm. yeah. in that, the relationships, uh, they endure without force, they endure organically, they, you know, and that's, what I'm interested in, I'm almost 20 years in the business. So, yeah. you know, that is greatly important to me. You know, you know, hot, not what, no, it's really about the quality of the relationship. Alex, since you kind of brought that up, how would you say Listen has um, sustained those um, relationships with its artists over, over 50 years in many cases? Um, well, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Some of some of these are things that I know for a fact, and some of these are things that I I understand from borrowed memories. <laughs> um, I think part of the gallery's history was given that given the gallery opened in the UK in London when in the '60s when there was there wasn't really an, even an audience for contemporary art. Um, it allowed it a certain degree of freedom to kind of do things that were a little bit strange, a little bit experimental, deeply uncommercial. Um, gallery wasn't really a real business until, I don't know, let's say the mid 80s. Mm. Um, and I don't think that's really possible today unless, you're, unless you have a gallery in, I don't know, somewhere, somewhere in the world where there isn't like a, a large, a large uh, collector base. Um, but incrementally over time, you know, the gallery moved to a slightly bigger space. It started taking on, to, took on another space, it moved locations, it, did it started making, you know, small books. It, over time, you do little things that you can do for artists that maybe other people aren't going to do. And because you have that history, and it depends upon whether the artists buy into that narrative of collective mm -hmm. history, um, whether you're going to be a good custodian for their legacy, for their history. Um, I think, I know all these things are kind of abstract, but they do take a long time. Mm. I think this idea that you open and then you've immediately got to go from here to here and become this giant operation is, is I think it's totally unrealistic. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess the question really is, how does one sustain your program and have it not be consumed mm. or, or, in, or, or let the market consume it? I guess that's the real question for, the, for, for another generation of galleries. Yeah. Yeah. And Nicole, you just started representing artists, right? Um, well, Calderon only represents one artist right. so far, <laughs> which is a huge feat. And I'm still, you know, I'm not sure. You know, I, I'm new, so we're developing our relationships and, and figuring all of that out. But um, it's incredibly challenging to be on the side where you are gallerist and artist liaison and um, running those two relationships parallel and uh, in New York City yeah. where I'm competing, you know, the gallery is a brand new, I've been working in this, in the gallery world for the last decade plus, so I have a lot of really great connections and relationships with people. However, I am in this situation where I'm looking at these multi-generational artists, but then you know, blue chips are looking at them too, and why would someone come work with me versus going to work with someone that could provide all these things that I can't perhaps financially provide? So I feel um, that I'm really leaning on my relationships, with, like human relationships with people and what the gallery mission and vision stands for, and, um, you know, looking for people that are mutually invested in the vision and the mission of the program. Mm. And keep them coming, Wealth and Council kind of is in its own way, this huge community of people like Rafa Sparza, Beatrice Cortez, Galaporis Kim, who all have worked together and been friends for years. Can you talk a little bit about um, how that community has kind of grown 
with the gallery and Young and his own relationships with, or their own relationships with the gallery? Yeah. Um, well, so, so, so my partner Young, he was an artist for a couple of decades before starting Commonwealth and um, lived, was born in Korea but lived most of his life in Los Angeles. So I think he already had like a community that he was a part of um, mm -hmm. that were the first kind of artists that showed with the space but also um, that the, the folks who came out to see the shows and support. Um, and so there was that kind of hope that Commonwealth and Council would be able to do multiple shows with the artists, but there was no real like blueprint or like predetermined path. And it kind of grew and evolved over the years, which I also think is, was possible because we're in LA, you know, in a place like New York. I think if you're doing interesting work, things just kind of get hyped up quickly and you have to grow and make certain decisions. Like, I don't think we would have turned to commercial and we would have had six, seven years to decide to turn to a commercial gallery that represents artists. Um, and, you know, but, but, but even though it probably wasn't explicitly articulated, I think that kind of um, commitment to a um, collective thriving was there from the beginning. It's, I mean, you know, for, for, for someone like Young, it's at the heart of his value system. And I think that's what attracted and or kind of strengthened the relationship between Young and the artists in those years when it was kind of this, I mean, you know, LA Times called our building ramshackle last year, so it still is, but um, <laughs> when it was even more ramshackle. Um, and, you know, I mean, I might be a yoga instructor in Hawaii in two years, but like, I'm just gonna say that the way we're trying to grow is uh, uh, really rooting ourselves, doubling down on that collective vision. You know, I mean, and that's something that we think about a lot and um, try to question in our own way when, when possible. In the art world, in our market, we love to anoint stars and. Um, you know, the, the, the very few artists get a lion's share of the attention, the resources, the opportunities. But, um, you know, uh, like an artist like Julie Tolentino, who is in the Whitney Biennial now, you know, she's been with the gallery since the beginning. You know, she's a legend. Um, she is a performance artist who's been making work since the 90s and, um, uh, uh, you know, part of ACT UP. and. Um, She's been such an inspiration and a linchpin artist for the program that many of our younger artists, particularly contending with the uh, a legacy of the AIDS crisis, really look up to. But you know, this is really her first institutional show ever, mm. ever. You know, she's never had a pro platform like this, and um, like it's important that we have artists like that, even though you know we've never sold a Julie Tolentino work and maybe never will, but. It's, it's important to us, you know, and it's important to the gallery community. And that's why they kind of are close and invested in this. Um, and, you know, and you mentioned Rafa Esparza, you know, when he was participating in the Whitney Biennial in 2017, he created an adobe space, a literal brown space within the white walls of the gallery um, and invited other Latinx artists to show within it, you know, sharing these platforms. So that kind of, um, uh, uh, collective survival, I think, is like really something that we hope will allow us to um, uh, 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 stay together um, as a gallery. And, 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 you know, so over the pandemic, and just I'm talking too much, but um, <laughs> over the pandemic, we started this like uh, one of the initiatives that we started is something we're calling the Council Fund. So because we started having these weekly Zooms with artists and they were saying, um, you know, we want to be able to get through this together. Like, can we think about kind of like safety nets we can create for ourselves um, uh, to help each other? And um, the council fund is basically when we make a sale to a collector or an institution, we ask them, is like you customarily, we might give you 10% discount or if it's a museum, 20%. Would you be willing to forego that or just take a part of it? And then there are, um, that will go towards this pot of money that the artists decide together on what they do with. And um, essentially, it's a redistributive scheme, yeah. you know, because the, you know, like any gallery, a handful of artists make 90% of the sales. 
And so it's like, in, in, in some ways, it's like they are aiding us to be able to help some of our artists in the program, like a Julie Tolentino, you know, who's very important and part of the community, but may not have a very active market. Um, and it's been a very important and enlightening um, initiative that has had a lot of these kinds of corollary effects, which have been very interesting and rewarding. So, you know, especially with like collectors, I think it really shifted the conversation a little bit yeah. and really like reaffirmed the fact that it's like, cause you know, cause some of them were actually kind of like said, well, some people are just like, pretend not to understand what we're talking about. It's like, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take my 10%. <laughs> But um, some folks, some folks have like, you know, come on and say like, yeah, like, why do I always take this discount, especially at our price levels for many of them, you know, it's, it's pretty negligible. But, you know, we, we tie these kinds of figures to the percentages to their like positionality in the art world and how important they are. But they're like, but in, at the end of the day, that's like taking money, like, or that's less money for the artists and the galleries that they support. So. Yeah. I think, and I think, and that, that is like a really, that, that is at the heart of what we do is like, yes, we saw our work. Yes, there's money being exchanged, but you know, um, yes, I, you know, I, I am a retail person, but uh, you know, the, the, the best part of the business is, as Alex said, is like, it's about the placement. It's about, it's about finding the best stewards for these works. And it's, it's, it's a long running commitment of support and a dialogue and it's really when these like true kinds of relationships and friendships emerge um, that this whole thing feels worthwhile. Yeah. Um, and so I want to pivot a little bit um, to just kind of talk about not only everything that's happened since 2020, the pandemic, um, the protests that swept the nation for racial justice, um, the war we're seeing now in Ukraine, um, but I guess how have how have those events not only impacted how the gallery operates from a spiritual level, but also um, with the pandemic and its shift to online? How has the business how have, have your businesses had to adapt or think of how the general market has adapted to apply that for, for places? Um, Nicole, why don't you start us off? Um, since I know that you you mentioned earlier, kind of you've always only known this moment, so but you worked at other galleries, you've witnessed kind of it. So how do you, how does all of that kind of make into, you know, deciding to do art fairs, having a brick and mortar space, knowing where your brick and mortar space is, online sales, um, participating in all of those different um, revenue stream, or, you know, potential revenue streams, essentially? Um, well, I mean, pandemic or no pandemic, it all comes down to money. And if, you know, this is a fully self-funded gallery, and depending on our budget, it's how we make our decisions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether it's participating at an art fair or um, doing bigger projects that we want to do, we, you know, we have to make these, we have to be very nimble about these decisions that we decide to invest in. Mm -hmm. And, um, for example, we just published our first book for the recent exhibition. And um, that is something that we, you know, every penny, counts and mm -hmm. for for my the Calderon and um, it's something that we were like always thinking about and so keeping that in mind it's how we move forward you know if I had endless funds I would do every art fair in the world because art fairs open up uh, us up to different markets around the world and mm -hmm. different new collectors and clients and so on and so forth um, so right now you will only see us in two art fairs mm -hmm. this year mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, everything is going down to, to building the program since I'm brand new and, you know, we're just constantly thinking about what our budget is and how to make it sustainable, sustainable and meaningful growth for Calderon's program in New York first before anything else. Before, and, you know, that also translates to the gallery, to the artists, um, to the public and how all those interactions kind of correlate with each other and, um, you know, we can't do, we can't move forward without the gallery and the artists that we do work with coming first. Mm -hmm. So that's our priority financially. Yeah. Nicola, how have you been able to kind of navigate? 
<laughs> well, I mean, I think that all the events, in a way, helped us, you know, mm -hmm. uh, gave us a, 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 an on-ramp kind of opportunity. And, you know, it certainly has caused, I think, people to think more mindfully about everything. And that is, in a sense, what was the missing ingredient for me, mm. you know, taking this larger leap into the art world. I think we're moving out of the, tra the chapter of the pirates mm. <laughs> a little bit and thinking more about collective survival and, and certainly our generation and so on. Um, and so that was a necessity for me to feel like it is worth burning my innards, mm -hmm. you know, for the business. And so all those events were meaningful uh, for us. And I think everyone is trying, you know, everyone will judge by, you know, what, how many degrees mm -hmm. one is being effective or not. But I think everyone's trying to understand and, and, and articulate what this moment means. And so, yeah, so I, I think that was great for us. That's something that is important to us. And in terms of the commerce, the business, you know, we, it's, we are, it's a business. So, um, you know, art fairs are important for us. We recognized immediately that they were going to be fundamental to how we, how we, how we operate. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, one can be cynical about it as many were before the pandemic. Oh, art fairs are horrible. Um, but they are great for generating business, for connecting with clients and local communities. And, you know, and if one thinks carefully and plans well, mm -hmm. it should work out. Mm -hmm. Alex, what about you? Um, well, I think I feel, I feel that everyone's still kind of unpacking crisis after crisis after crisis mm -hmm. after crisis totally. and what it all means as a collective whole. I think it's very hard to take one single lesson out of mm -hmm. it. Um, I do feel that something strange has happened. And it, it was already happening, but it, was, it sort of got heightened because of COVID and everyone being locked away and experiencing everything through a screen. Um, people's taste, for want of a better word, um, has kind of been dictated by what looks, what's, what reproduces well on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really weird. <laughs> it's really weird. It's deeply problematic. It doesn't necessarily allow for nuance. And we deal in, we deal in a world which, which, which relies on objects. Mm -hmm. And they have to be seen and experienced in person. And I've seen things happen re regularly where you see work and it looks good on an image and then you see it in person and it's not as good or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And the, the second's actually far more interesting. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I worry a little, about, little bit about this kind of race to e-commerce and this, this race to everything being digital because I do think it detracts from the experience of standing in front of something and really taking it in mm -hmm. beyond a five second Instagram scroll. Um, and I think we've all been so sucked into to, to that as a platform because of the news, because we've had no external experiences. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've, I would like to see us find some way out of that. Mm. Yeah. Um, Kivam, did you have anything to add? You kind of, you mentioned the, the council, so that was kind of, you know, response, but you were also on the selection committee for um, Miami this year, correct? Or last year, correct? So. Oh, I mean, well, if we're talking about kind of. Sh what was the question? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, well, I guess, how would you say art fairs, just going. Oh, yeah. And the experiential within art, seeing yeah. stuff in person? I mean, I don't know. Is there anyone looking at OVRs anymore? <laughs> it's, I don't know. I, I'm so over OVRs. <laughs> and. Um, I don't know, at least the conversations I've had with colleagues, like it just doesn't work yeah. because anything that would sell on an OVR, exactly as Alex said, are the kind of what looks good on an iPhone kind of thing, we could sell easily by sending an email. Mm. You know? More effectively, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with those kinds of works, we probably want to be careful about where it goes. So we're not going to put that on an OVR. And, you know, 
I mean, you try selling a, a rusted Beatrice Cortez online, you know, on an OVR. <laughs> it's art, not easy. So, um, yeah, I, I, feel, I, feel, I feel like that, in my mind, that hasn't made as big of an impact. But yes, but many, many folks are buying straight off of PDFs. So that is perhaps a big shift from kind of that in-person relationship. But for a gallery like us that's um, in Los Angeles, like, it is important because we have a global audience and we don't have the kind of critical mass of um, collectors and institutions that New York does. Um, and yeah, and for, for better or worse, like art fairs are critical to, um, I mean, just being able to connect like yeah. this and see folks. And a lot of it is like, you know, it's about like planting seeds to the relationship that just, it might have been just like a brief hello, but you know, um, they're, 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 they're a very important lifeline to the uh, larger ecosystem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we should open it up for questions. Yeah. Are we at that time? Um, what's, are there mics? Thanks, hi. So as we're talking about the object and the experience, um, and there's a lot of conversation about uh, the art field, how uh, the shift has gone from the art object to the art experience. Mm -hmm. Like, how has this shifted what your artists are doing and how you're supporting your artists? <laughs> Sorry, um, art experience. Like you mean like on uh, like PDFs and things like that, or what do you like immersive? Yeah. Well, yeah, like immersive installations yeah. and oh. the exp like time-based things and spending time with work and being in a, you know, a place and how places shift in the meaning of work and yeah, um, things like that. I mean, I do think objects have experiences as well. I mean, I think one can learn largely from the idea that a full immersion creates a sensory shift and still apply that to something of uh, you know, lesser magnitude. Um, I think it's always important to consider the way uh, your viewers feel when they come into a space. So, you know, immersion, less immersion, it, you know, I, th that is important to me, that there is an experience, whether it's immersive or not. I think there's been this, this one of the big lessons coming out of COVID and people not being able to come into the gallery, not being able to travel, not being able to see shows, is the, important of, the importance of exhibitions, the importance mm -hmm. of a show that an artist has conceived as a body of work, rather than just seeing an individual piece here and there, especially if you don't know the work of an artist, you see, see one object, it doesn't tell you the history of their work. Yeah. It doesn't tell you their vision necessarily. So I, I do think it's a little old fashioned in a sense, but reverting back to really investing in shows and getting people in to see exhibitions. I think it's really important. Yeah. Hello. Um, I have a question, especially for the smaller galleries, um, speaking of the next generation, and that is about art association, meaning you have a small gallery in Los Angeles, you have a small gallery in New York, you want to do the art fairs in Madrid. You want to be able to show in Latin America. Talk to me about how you see integrating or working with other galleries rather than the other kind of, sorry to say, but pace Gagosian model, which is just like expand, expand, expand yourself, which for some of us smaller galleries is not, neither our ambition nor an interesting finance model. I mean, I think there's so many versions of that these days, and there's been a real like proliferation of these sorts of like intergallery initiatives out of COVID. So, I mean, uh, from LA, we have a gallery association, in Los Angeles, which first started out as an OVR during the height of the pandemic. Um, but it, it's kind of been able to evolve into a proper gallery association, hopefully with some like lobbying power and um, things like that. Uh, I mean, there are myriad examples prior to the pandemic. I think Vanessa Carlo starting Condo, yeah. um, where galleries are actually switching locations and hosting other galleries with no fees attached to it. 
I think that kind of thing really um, showed the potential of um, collaborative uh, uh, work and sharing resources and audiences. Um, she was also behind another gallery association, was it like IEGA or something like that? Yeah, something that yeah. started last year. Mm -hmm. There's like South South, which is like galleries that are focused more on artists from the global South. Um, mm. Yeah, I think that there, there are myriad um, initiatives. The thing is, is like, 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 but like, um, I mean, to be completely frank with you, there have been so many initiatives, like we've started saying no to most things because like it's, it's also time, you know, even to hop on a Zoom. Um, and it's, you know, it's like those like thousand dollar checks add up. Um, but uh, the, uh, yeah, like, 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 I, I mean, I think it's an, I think, I, I, I think it is important for the smaller spaces to continue to challenge um, or, or figure out like what, uh, collaborative growth looks like um, to be able to just keep our doors open. Um, and I mean, we're actually partnering with uh, uh, gallery, Galeria Agustina Ferreira from Puerto Rico to open a space in Mexico City. Mm. So we don't have to invest fully in opening up a space, but we can rotate, which feels much more um, feasible at this point. Um, but I mean, what I'd like to flag in these kinds of discussions is um, I, this is my hunch that um, we're going to enter an era of conglomeratization in the gallery world. I think conglomeratization. Yeah. Um, so I think, I don't know, I, I mean, you're going to call it. I think, I think, I think Pace by Ken Griffin is a harbinger of things to come. And yeah. in some ways, in, um, projects like 50 to Walker that is backed by Zwarner and things like that. Um, I have a feeling we're going to see more examples of like, you know, how like fashion in the 90s created like LVMH and Caring. You know, they were all independent brands before, mm. you know. Um, or even Art Basel's expansion into Paris. Yeah, yeah. Like I think, I think this kind of the, 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 I think we're going to see some of these like smaller spaces get gobbled up. Mm. Like, um, and, <laughs> you know, I have, I have my thoughts about that. <laughs> um, hi, I just wanted to um, say I'm a little perplexed that we're talking about the digital revolution as if it was something that happened during COVID, um, because it was so far advanced um, before the lockdown that, that or the, the, our closures. But I think it was probably, I'd love to hear you talk about the fact that in the last decade, it was probably the single most important and impactful um, development, you know, in the world in general, and the massive impact on the art world. And the fact, as Alex was saying, that it became the, the, the method by which people were buying work from all over the world through the screen of their telephone. You know, so just, if you could just address it a little more generally and especially in, in relation to how you frame that within your own galleries, especially the galleries that are nascent. I guess the, I guess the, you're right, that I mean that people have been, 10 years ago people massively upgraded their websites to be more kind of immersive, more kind of content for want of a better word. Um, and there was this proliferation of people selling work via images purely um, I do think there is a slight difference between that and putting a bunch of work on a website and clicking buy now. I do think there is a, I do think there is a hard difference between those because one is like actively saying to someone, hey, I think you should look at this. I find it really interesting. We have a relationship. I trust you. You trust me. And the other is a scattergun, let's see what shows up approach. And that, I find, is kind of anathema to what we do as custodians of, a, of an artist's career. Aren't they all part of the same continuum? They're part of the same range. Sure, on a platform level, yeah, they're part of the same range. They're produced by the same, sure. by the same mechanism. But I also, yeah. I also think you hear a lot of very small anecdotes of people buying on Instagram. And I think that gets leveled up as opposed to what's actually happening. I don't think not everyone is doing that. It's, those are the stories that rise to the top as part of a news cycle as opposed to what's actually 
happening on the ground and what we've heard the panelists talk. And Nicola, you're... I was going to say it's all part of a natural evolution. These are things we can't ignore. Um, one might have certain feelings about uh, all these things, but effectively it's, it's, a, it's a survival uh, adaptability dichotomy that um, during the pandemic people could not come to galleries, therefore they had to buy from uh, PDFs and things like this. I guess I'm not making it out of that. I'm saying it's revolutionized the way that people yeah. Yeah. Look at or Mexico City or wherever else. Yeah. Localized market. Yeah, and I think and so that it's it's, it's, well. imp it's important. It's part of the natural progression of the business. And it's important that it is engaged as such that all those things are tended to because that's part of how business continues to grow. So whether it's social media, uh, you know, online content. How how are the, how are you engaging your uh, viewer meaningfully and interestingly? And the digital road, the digital thoroughfare, is <laughs> perhaps the single most important, wide-reaching tool. So we can't ignore it. We have to do it. But you know, we can do it in our own individual ways. I mean, I just think, feel as one may about one thing or the other, part of the future of our business. Um, I'd like to see if I can slip in two brief questions. The first is for Nicola. You have an amazing show up right now. This is work that is very graphically readable, so I would imagine it can be easily appreciated and people can make commitments based upon reproduction. But the real power of the work comes through the delicacy of the different surfaces and how they fit together and the, and the um, specificity of a very um, shallow space, yeah. which does, amongst other things, have references back to cubism, which you will never pick up from the graphic nature. So I'm just curious for you yeah. um, how much, uh, to the extent you're comfortable sharing, mm -hmm. how much of the show has been sold, to, of the works, have been sold to people who have seen the work, mm. and how much to people who have not, yeah. and how do you balance these in your own way of thinking That's about how to prioritize? Such a great question, because I have literally been kind of reviewing the thinking as this presented itself, because it was a, a kind of a new experience for us that you know, we have a show by Frida Orupaba, who lives in Oslo, who is not a kind of American forward artist, therefore she's not so well known and, you know, doesn't sort of move around like an American artist in America. And, uh, and then the work with all its delicacy and sculptural, you know, dimensionality, all the qualities. And so I thought, my God, you cannot understand this work unless you see it. And it was clear sending out the PDFs and so on that some people understood it because they knew the work and then others who had not were intrigued but they did not understand the extent of the kind of marvel. So therefore we had to say who came got priority. Yeah, who came to see the show means they understood the work. You know? and just a coda to that. Um, it was probably at least 10 years ago that a very major uh, dealer mm -hmm. said to me that more than 50% of what they sell, and this is a primary market gallery, mm -hmm. is to people who have never come to see the work, mm -hmm. which I found as a kind of shocking statistic, which I'm sure, I mean, I've done all the buying that I've done for clients and, and for myself, 90% without having seen the work, whereas in the past I never would have recommended anything if I hadn't actually seen it in right. person. So some of it's yeah. a reality. But I did have a quick question for you, Alex, if I may. Um, so you're in a somewhat different position from the other people on this panel, insofar as you are in a multi-generational gallery, um, one where, which operated according to old rules, meaning that as, as time went on and art evolved, Nicholas continued to show the most interesting next generations of artists, and that kind of progressed somewhere into the 80s. Um, you're now coming into this from a different generation with an eye toward how it is that you want to shape the gallery and toward your interest both in 
overlooked historical artist and a very contemporary artist. So how do you, like you could be one step, one foot into a mega gallery and one foot into, um, into kind of dealing in the, in the details of, of art as it's happening. So I'm just curious as to how you navigate that and how you think about it yourself for the future of the gallery. So that's, that's, a, that's a, a very interesting question because it's, again, it's something I think about an enormous amount. Um, there is, I think it does speak to the gallery's history. The gallery's always been a gallery that showed young emerging artists. Many of those young emerging artists have been with the gallery now 30, 40, 50 years, and they're very, very famous and successful. But that's the approach that the gallery takes and always has taken. Um, that's changed little in that we've now, in the last 10 years, taken on older artists whose careers have been overlooked. Um, but we, can, we come, out with, come at it with the same approach. We're also taking on artists who were their first gallery. And that's been the case for decades. We've been many artists' first gallery. We've been many artists' only gallery. Um, so in a sense, I don't see it as much of a step change. It's more of a kind of continuation of what has been happening. It's just, it's just a generational shift. I, ha I have a brief question right up here um, for the whole panel, but spe specifically to go off of um, something that uh, Kibum said. Um, you mentioned at the end that uh, you believe that smaller galleries were going to be gobbled up and this concept of uh, conglomerization. Um, so I'm kind of curious what your all uh, opinions are of this idea of the spectrum of decentralization versus centralization and the idea that um, this growing trend of decentralization um, through NFTs and DAOs um, providing more autonomy and, and more tools to younger artists and the next generation. Um, so I'm kind of curious what your opinions are with the gallery inherently being a centralized organization with the growing trends and if you have any direct response to tools like DAOs providing centralized, um, decentralized funding to um, you know, token holders. Um, I, feel, uh, I feel like, it's, like it, it's kind of inherently, pro unless, I, I, I don't know if anyone in here has any external like, investors in the gallery. I mean, I know some galleries do. Um, we never have. I think there is something, you're, you're, you're inevitably beholden to someone or something. If it's a, if it's a, DA, if it's a DAO, you know, it's a, you're beholden to someone who is holding your purse strings. And I think that is difficult if you want to be nimble and have a vision and do something that is possibly deeply uncommercial at times, but is for the greater good. I think, it, I think, it's, I think it's deeply problematic. I mean, you know, you know, you look at a project like 52 Walker, which has had great shows, you know, thus far. I'm biased because one of ours showed there. But, um, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I mean, I, I, think, I think generally, if we do continue to see these kinds of, like, uh, consolidation, it'll have a flattening effect. Um, and again, like, I look towards the fashion industry. Um, you know, um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and you know, it's been it's been interesting to see because I think I think I think we, you can kind of see the, the ill effects. So these design young designers get snapped up as soon as they start some, doing something interesting. So they get um, put behind uh, to to lead a prestige brand, their own brand. They have to not just design the seasons, but like the the, the mid season capsules, can capsule collections, and what have you. They have to be in charge of like 20 collections a year, and inevitably, most of them burn out and just like do something wild and go away, you know. Um, and I would love to keep that what the, the potential of that like in mind for the art world. But then, like I think we do see this sort of um, real attachment to maintaining autonomy um, and this kind of correction, perhaps in. Um, smaller brands like um, Telfar and Luar and Baragon, a lot of which are started and owned by um, you know POC designers, and I think there's a reason why that is. Um, um, questioning the system that didn't necessarily hold space for them, yeah. you know, and um, yeah, I, I would I would love to continue to think about and 
you know, subvert, question the market, and carve out a space where all of us can maintain our distinctive voices and thrive. Maria Tari? We can take one. Thanks. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to say uh, to the organizers, thank you for organizing this. I mean, obviously, we're all here because we adore art, and only second to adoring art is adoring talking about art, and this has been a fascinating little symposium. So I have a question for Kiboom, which I have been enjoying everything that you have all been saying, but the one thing that um, you spoke about where there was a real sparkle in your eye was your artist, I really can't remember her entire name, but Valentina, who is in the Whitney Biennial, and I just think that's so fascinating that here you described her as a really unknown artist in comparison to your program, and how did you get her into the Whitney Biennial? And I mean, that's every artist's dream, every gallerist's dream, and it's so exciting, and you, I, I just would love to hear more about that. Oh, uh, so you mean I think Julie, Julie right? Tolentino, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Julie Tolentino. Yes. Um, well, well, but that's like the funny thing, right? Is um, like, yes, like she, she, she hasn't had these kinds of opportunities, but she has been in the scene. She lived in New York for a long time. Um, and, um, you know, she was in the original um, performing troupe for Ron Athey. And so her own performances, you know, involve a lot of like blood, sweat and um, um, as well. Uh, so she's kind of like a, like a, like what you would call a cult figure. So there have been fans and supporters all this time. And um, I think, you know, like this is, I, 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 I try to do this and I tell this to all our colleagues too, is like, you know, we have, we, right now we represent 36 artists. You're going to have talks with um, collectors and curators. You obviously can't like go through 36. Oftentimes they come to you with one or two that they want to talk about. I try to always make it a point to include one more person, you know? And, and whether by email, I'm going to like, you know, by the way, I'd love for you to take a look at this artist's work. This is the portfolio mm -hmm. um, while I have their attention. Of course, it can, it can become a bit of like a Sophie's choice because you can't do that for like you know, a 10 artists. But we always try to be kind of very like thoughtful and strategic about that kind of thing. I personally, like as much as I'd love to, can't take credit for Julie's inclusion in the Whitney Biennial. I think largely it was because of um, uh, the vision of Adrian Edwards, who has been a passionate advocate for um, performance art for a long time. So. Uh, that kind of conversation relationship really came out of that. And yeah, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful show. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone.